I'm back after three weeks due to some stuff. But before we start, I just want to say thank you so much for watching the previous video about Freddie Mercury. Initially, I was like, you know, I'm just going to upload it and see how it goes. But I wasn't expecting this amount of views and likes. So thank you so much for even leaving it in the background to watch or actually paying attention to watch. Thank you. Even though I did not really intend it to be people oriented, but the whole point of doing this is not like to do it specifically on like musicians or whatever. I, I want it to be more in a general perspective where if I find an idea interesting or it hasn't really been in depth in like YouTube or anything, I would like to do that. This video will be about Daryl Davis, who is unironically another musician but an R&B musician rock and roll too who also happens to be a person who talked to the Ku Klux Klan KKK which I will get more in depth about but just to make one thing kind of clear compared to the Freddie Mercury video is that it will be very conversation heavy so I will forge my way forward, obviously, but I hope it's not tediously long or whatever. But yeah, hope you enjoy. Thank you once again for just being here. So chapter one, upbringing around the world and a canon event. He was born on March 16, 1958, which in current 2023, he's just 65 years old. And he lived in Chicago, Illinois, of the US. As a child, he'd always moved around the world as his dad was working in the Department of State, the Foreign Service Office. For short, DOS is responsible for the country's foreign policy and relations, and FSO, they formulate and implement foreign policy of the United States. Due to country hopping, like once every several months, he was accustomed to schools with students from various nations, races, and cultures. Which is really cool. In his time in these schools, for the amount of years that he went for, they had Nigerians, Italians, Russians, Swedes, Germans, and many more. It was the norm, so getting along with people from various cultures, skin color, was very easy for Davis, and vice versa from other people's perspective. But when he reached 10 years old, which was in 1968, they went back to the US. He decided to attend an all-white club scout pack in Belmont, Massachusetts. And according to him, he said, I either went to an all-black school or black and white school. I was the only one of two black kids in the Belmont school. And Cub Scout, for those who don't know, is a program associated with scouting for younger children between the ages of 7 and 12. Participants in the programs were called Cubs. A group of Cubs is called a pack, hence the name Cub Scout. So this was important to mention that he was part of a Cub Scout program because at age 10, in an incident, while carrying the flag and marching with his peers in a local parade, from Lexington to Concord to commemorate the ride of Paul Revere, Anything Nicholas here, I had no clue that this walk meant more than just being a scout even though it's just from Lexington to Concord but apparently it had to do with some war that happened in the 1775s and it is also part of the itinerary if you happen to visit Massachusetts and Paul Revere he is apparently a pretty well-known fellow if you knew him in the 1700s. He's known for being a silversmith, a folk hero, early industrialist, and a patriot. From what I'm reading, he's really well known. Back to the video. People threw rocks and bottles from the crowd, which then led the pack leaders to respond by forming a protective ring around Davis. You know, being 10 years old, you'd be so confused, right? This is like several, year, several decades after this happened, and then looking back, he was just trying to think what he thought when he was 10 years old. So this is what he said about the event. Initially, I thought they must have had something against the scouts until my cop master and other adults huddled over me and escorted me out of the area only to realize I was the only one getting hit. 
Later that day, as my parents cleaned me up, they explained racism for the first time. I have never heard of that word because I have never been exposed to it. I mean, he was literally in schools that had people from different countries. So obviously, you know, he was open enough to be like, what the hell, what is racism? I now face that. And he also continued to say, it made no logical sense to me. How could someone hate me? when he didn't even know me. In my latter years, when I questioned, the answers were always the same. There are some people who are just like that. You know, that one that one thing is like, you cannot disrespect your elders, you know, you shouldn't. They're older than you, and then you ask why, even though they did something horrific. Then they just say, because it's the custom or whatever. Asian people can relate to that a lot. And I think it's a stereotype where it should be broken. Because I have my fair share of experiences too, but I'm not going to get into it because this is about Daryl Davis, so let's move on. Anywho, he then said, that wasn't enough for me. What does just like that mean? Where did it come from? You're not born just like that, rightfully so. Due to it being so irrational in his mind, Davis was just curious regarding the origins of such discrimination, in which, of course, shaped his views in the latter years and how he approached the issue. Chapter 2, Music Why this pivot? I mean, I did say in the title, right? That he was an R&B musician and a rock and roll guy as well Before he became this guy who was also known for tackling racism as well So yeah, music did play an important role It was literally the only reason why it just blossomed into like whatever it was today what he's known for at least, one of the things he's known for. So when he was playing music, he absorbed the style of blues musicians from the Mississippi Delta. In 1980, when he was 22 years old, he earned a Bachelor of Music degree from Howard University, while also being a member of their choir and jazz vocal ensemble. He was mentored by pianist Pine Top Perkins and Johnny Johnson little bit about them. Pine Top Perkins, also known as Joe Whaley Pine Top Perkins, was a blues pianist. He was born on July 7th, 1913. He played the most influential blues and rock and roll, while receiving numerous honors, including a Grammy Lifetime Achievement. Pretty badass. And he got his name on the Blues Halls of Fame. Do I need to say more? This guy is pretty, he's pretty up there, you know, in the ranks. But he passed away on March 11, 2011, due to a cardiac arrest in his sleep at age 97. Editor's note number two. I was trying to find an appropriate image for Pine Top Perkins' funeral or something to do with that. And then I stumbled across a blog spot dedicated to Mississippi Blues Trail. And I'm assuming that they document the places that they go to see who these people are and it's well formatted from A all the way to Z and I'm assuming these are German people who are well versed in English as well so yeah links will be down below check them out pretty cool stuff Johnny Johnson also known as Johnny Clyde Johnson was an American pianist that played jazz blues and rock and roll he was born on July 8th 1924 which was exactly 11 years and one day after Pine Top. His work with Chuck Berry inducted him into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was posthumously awarded Congressional Gold Medal for breaking racial barriers in the military as a Montfort Point Marine, enduring racism while inspiring social change while integrated in an all-white Marine Corps in World War II. The coincidences here are amazing because the people he worked with had like a history of like being influential in a way that it's not cool to be a racist and the approach that they had is just bar none amazing as well however he passed away on april 13th 2005 due to a kidney ailment and having pneumonia as well so knowing these things it must have been an honor to work with them but what is even more of an honor is that they claimed Davis as their godson. They praised Davis' ability to master a piano style that was popular way before Davis was born. And this is according to the Kennedy Center profile. 
Kennedy Center is obviously dedicated to John F. Kennedy. So this center mainly hosted arts such as theater, dance, orchestras, jazz, pop, psychedelic, and folk music. As his career in like the music sphere, he frequently played backup for Chuck Berry and Jerry Lewis. Tiny bit again. Charles Edward Anderson Berry, also known as Chuck Berry, he's known as the pioneer of rock and roll. Before and during this, he had his hand in being a singer, a guitarist, and a songwriter. He's nicknamed the father of rock and roll. His lyrics consisted of teenage life and consumerism, introducing a music style such as guitar solos and showmanship. Shout out to Freddie or shout out to Michael Jackson in that one song that had that solo guitar rip, Badass. And Jerry Lee Lewis is also the pioneer of rock and roll and rockabilly music. They work together as well. Daryl Davis was also friends with Muddy Waters. McKinley Morganfield, also known as Muddy Waters, was vital in post-World War II blues, where he's often cited as the father of modern Chicago blues. His style of playing was mostly described as the raining down Delta Beautitude. I guess that sounds cool. As his career, you know, playing as backup for these people, being friends with these people as well. He was the pianist in the legendary blues band. He performed with B.B. King. I don't think that man needs no introduction, you already know him, but here's his face, the types of music he played as well, so shout out, you know, all these really well-known, really cool blues musicians. He also played alongside other artists such as Elvis, Jordanaires, Platters, Drifters, Coasters, Bo Diddley, Percy Sledge, and Sam Moore. Daryl Davis was also awarded Best Traditional Blues or R&B Instrumentalist in 2009's Washington Area Music Award. He was also an artistic director of the Centrum Acoustic Blues Festival. And according to the Guardian's article, Davis was noted saying that he will always play music regardless of the style because he believed that music in all its forms are great equalizers. As much as I raved about, you know, people that he worked with, you know, it is important to say that as much as these people are, that's how important Daryl Davis is into the whole scene of music and most importantly, combating racism as well. As we will push forward more in the later chapters. Now that we know his love for music and his upbringing in music, we're gonna go to the meat of the conversation here, conversing with KKK members. Chapter three, first encounters and revelations. Ever since he got thrown stuff at, you know, as a kid, and I'm pretty sure he had more incidents that he didn't mention in the public, he was curious about, you know, the roots of racism and only delved further into it in his adult life. As a summarization of his methodology, he would improve relations amongst the race by purposefully seeking out, having a dialogue, and then befriending the Ku Klux Klan. Just to have it there for the people who live under a rock, Ku Klux Klan, better known as the KKK, was formed in 1865 by Confederate soldiers during the end of the American Civil War in order to suppress slaves in a more attractive manner. Although a century and five decades have passed, what remains consistent till in 2023 is the racial discrimination towards people of color. Sometimes it also escalates to full-on assault and even murder. And that's about it really because these guys are pieces of shit so I'm not going to talk more about them. Just that they look goofy as hell in these white costumes that they wear and what they even stand for is even worse. So yeah, they, they can shove it. If they don't know where, I'm sorry, I can help you. But there, there's your executive summary of these pieces of shit. Anywho, back to the main topic. Once he befriended them, the friendship blossomed. The clansmen then realized their hate was misguided, obviously. In his pursuit, he managed to convince over 200 clansmen to give it up entirely, 
while metaphorically leaving the rope hanging. Davis then asked them, like, hey, can I have your rope? Then some of them would give it to him. And he would normally keep them as a memorabilia of the impact that he made just by treating them like normal people while talking over a meal even. So, yeah. In 1983, when he was 25 years old, he decided to play at an all-white country bar in Frederick, Maryland that was called the Silver Dollar Lounge. Although he was the only black person there, he wasn't, you know, moved by it. He's like, so what? I'm just a person, right? These guys are people too. While not Davis's first time playing there, it was his most significant that boosted off his career into not only R&B, but also in the aspect of how to combat racism in a civilized manner. So after his bandmates and him finished the set, he was approached by a patron of the, of the bar, 15 years, 20 years older than him. And although not unusual for working musicians to be complimented, what made it notable was that the fellow praised Davis while remarking he had never seen a black man play like Jerry Lee Lewis. So here's how the dialogue went. I really enjoyed your music. Davis obviously thanked him, shook his hand while he said, That is the first time I've ever heard a black man play a piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. Daryl obviously shocked said, Who do you think taught Jerry Lee Lewis to play that kind of style? Then the guy said, I don't know. Daryl replied, He learned it from the same place I did. Black blues and boogie woogie piano players. That's where the rockabilly, rock and roll style came from. The guy then replied, Oh no, Jerry Lee invented that. I ain't never heard no black man except for you play like that. Daryl then was thinking to himself, has this guy never heard of Fats, Domino or Little Richard? The guy then proceeded to invite him for a drink and since Daryl Davis doesn't drink, he ordered a cranberry juice and cheered together. The guy then replied, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black guy. Trying to figure it out, Daryl said, How is it in my lifetime of sitting with thousands of white people, having a beverage, meals and conversation, this guy being 15 to 20 years old, older than me has never in his life sat beside a black guy to just have a drink? Then Daryl asked him, How is that? Why? The guy didn't reply initially, but the friend nudged him and encouraged him to say it. Come on, tell him, just tell him. Come on, you gotta say it. And the guy then said, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Daryl Davis, remembering about this situation, he said, I burst out laughing because I was in disbelief. Maybe he was pulling my leg, I thought. While I laughed, he flipped through his wallet to only produce his Klan card and handed it to me. I immediately stopped laughing. I recognized the Klan symbol and the guy wasn't actually kidding. I was then left wondering why am I sitting with a clansman? Then I remembered music was the thing that brought us together. Chapter 4 Conversation Aftermath and Meeting Roger Kelly, the Grand Dragon. After the conversation had happened, you know, they obviously had their later chatters that wasn't really available, there's no transcripts of it, but I assumed that it went well. So after that, the patron wanted. Daryl to call him and let him know any time Daryl returned to the bar and played with the band. The seed was then planted, but in order for it to grow, nourishment was important, according to Daryl Davis. And that was what Daryl did. On his breaks, he would go to the table and say hey to the guy. And some of the guy's friends would hang around while the others would go to the other side of the room. I wonder why, oh my god, right? Not being subtle at all, these guys. Eventually, I quit the band and went back to playing rock and roll. But some time later, however, the question that went unanswered my entire youth of how someone could hate me when they don't even know me, when the answer was right in front of me the whole time. Over the years, Daryl Davis and the guy, he's not really mentioned, I'm sorry, I would just call him the patron guy from the bar, but he doesn't have a name in the conversation because he doesn't want to oust him, I guess. Good good, good for him, but for me, I'm, I'm like, bro, I don't know the name. 
in who Daryl Davis and the patron became close friends while conversing for hours on end, untangling the knots of hate that was coiled over the decades since the American Civil War. The key to all this, according to Daryl Davis, was to have civilized dialogues. This then led to the members to quit the organization because they no longer believed in the crap. What began as a hobby gradually became a calling. While his music career flourished, Daryl became more intrigued in the world's most oddest hustle, meeting with KKK members of various ranks and attending cross-burning rallies. For starters, he decided to show up at the patron's house unannounced. He then replied obviously saying, Daryl, what are you doing here? Catching up, Daryl told him he wanted to interview Roger Kelly, the clan leader. He was known as the Grand Dragon of Maryland. He oversaw all clan operations in the state. After some convincing, the guy gave Davis Mr. Kelly's number and address on the condition that he never tells where he got it from. A stern warning was then uttered. Don't fool with him. He will actually kill you. Which was the entirety of why Daryl wanted to meet him in the first place to, you know, cut the crap, talk to him how it is. Mary, who was Davis's secretary, scheduled an interview with Mr. Kelly under the pretense of not mentioning the color of Davis's skin color. Big brain, you know. According to Wikipedia and the dialogue that was said, my secretary called him and I told her, do not tell Roger Kelly I'm black. Just tell him I'm writing a book about the clan. I wanted her to call because she's white. I knew just enough about the mentality of the clan that they would never think a white person would work for a black person. She called him and he didn't ask what color I was. So we arranged to meet at a motel. So this is in comparison to like the scene in Black Klansman. And if any of you guys don't know the movie, Watch it. It's a really good movie that's directed by Spike Lee. So he's also a very well-known director for like doing these kinds of movies. You can call him like the underrated director, but he has been there. There's just not many people that I've talked to know about him until I show them the film. Like, oh my God, where's this film from? Why have I not known about this? To draw a comparison from the scene, it is particularly this one where John David Washington called the visit while acting super white. So. In the movie as well, it shows the Grand Wizard utilizing, you know, p semantics describing how black people versus white people would talk. Like the intonations of chicken or the exaggerations of words like, hey, my soul brother kind of thing. You know, you know that stereotypical thing that black people get picked on for fun. KKK actually does that as to discriminate the black people. I'm like, what? So that's what the scene is about and I'm not going to clip it because I don't want to get claimed but these are shots and these are the dialogues that were said. So yeah. So tense would be the more appropriate word to describe the conversation. So the next minute or two will be dedicated to just unpacking whatever unfolded during the meetup according to the several websites that I chose from and see how it matches like some filled in the blanks some didn't have it so I just you know did the mishmash of it I feel that it's important to break down the conversation because if not people will be asking why is this Daryl Davis guy important there are like much better examples I know there is there's Martin Luther King you know but they're popular people the people that came after him aren't really spoken about I mean there are but in terms of R&B musicians, how many have you heard about them? None, right? So, it's to showcase that a person like him, Daryl Davis, had such a unique perspective on approaching situations to just talk directly in front of the problem instead of talking about it to our friends. You know, like how it is so normalized to like talk shit behind someone's back. Even myself included, I like doing that. And that's why I feel it is an educational point to be like, oh, this is how I can approach it? To converse with them like a normal person? Okay. You know, and um, second one would be to 
combat racist or super extremist people that surround us you don't even have to look like to the us or like other european or western countries you can just look around you like how am i gonna approach this and to top it off before i go into the unpacking of the conversation this is important too because as daryl davis said for growth to begin nourishment is needed but that won't ha happen overnight obviously so as time goes on you create a rapport with that person and be like hey it's not cool to talk like that it's not cool to say that word it's not cool to be hating a race because of who they are you can't change they can't change who they are you know it's them this is the um unpacking of the situation so on the dot of the time that was set a knock on the door of the motel happened mary opened the door roger kelly's bodyguard also known as the grand night hawk entered the room with a handgun on his head the night hawk froze as he saw daryl same for mr kelly who was right behind him as confusion sets in daryl just stood up while indicating he has no weapon on him in his palms like this Sticking on his right hand, Daryl said, Hey, Mr. Kelly, I'm Daryl Davis. And Mr. Kelly also shook. Before moving forward, Mr. Kelly requested for an identification. Daryl obliged, provided him his driver's license. Oh, you live on Silver Spring Street. Daryl wondered, one, why was he looking at the address? Two, are they going to conduct a cross burning at my yard? Wanting to appear unconcerned, Daryl replied, Yeah, Mr. Kelly, that's where I live. Mr. Kelly smiles and nods, only to find out, years down the road, due to Daryl's own presumptions, his own words, not mine, that one of the members lived down the road from Daryl's house. Mr. Kelly often traveled down the same road to see the member. Hence, why was he looking at the address? Boom, got it, got the answer. The interview was then for the most part, smooth sailing for like the first hour, but was then interrupted by a noise of crashing out of the blue. A chashut. Urban described it as a Cajun word describing something you don't know the name of. A chashut. Everybody jumped. Through the process of elimination, Daryl thought, Mr. Kelly must have made it, while also wondering, what did I do to piss him off? A stare-off happened between Mr. Kelly and Daryl, with eyes questioning each other. What did either of us just do? Mary was the only one in the know about this, and essentially, it was the eyes that she had put in the cooler that had melted. Hence, several soda cans falling. And due to that, everyone just started laughing, due to the ignorance everyone in the room had except for Mary, of course. Daryl thought it was a moment of teachability, wherein a, the bucket of ice became a thing of fear amongst the people in the room. So in the book that Daryl Davis wrote, he said, regarding the situation, ignorance breeds fear. Fear breeds hatred. Hatred breeds anger. Anger breeds destruction. A shootout might have happened, or Daryl could have hurt either of them. If it weren't for Mary stooping in and be like, hey, it's just the eyes, don't worry. It's nothing nothing wrong happened. Not yet. Not ever. So in his conversation with CBC, in the outcome of the conversation, he recalls he felt that he was superior to me. Felt that the black man had smaller brains than white people. That we are prone to crime. We are lazy. You know. The stereotypes. I heard them all. Daryl then never expected that insulting and nerve wracking first meeting would result in decades long friendship. We continued the conversation for years. He invited me to his home to clan rallies. And adding to that, clan rallies normally consisted of ritualistic chants being intoned, giant crosses burned deeply racial stereotypes that form the foundation of the hatred of, from the clan. And through this, Daryl listened, questioned, took notes, and dispelled them slowly, in which the gap between were narrowed enough for them to become friends. Daryl said, Mr. Kelly gave it up as a result of our friendship. Today, his robe and hood are in my closet. 
in 2016, he had collected an estimate of 26 robes. And to go in further, Mr. Kelly even invited Daryl to become his daughter's godfather. And as per always, that wasn't the last gift or the last clansman he would befriend. And a little bit more about the article through CBC, they really made a great point of showcasing the approach that Daryl Davis had. And I'll dive in further before moving on. So, in Daryl Davis's pursuit of this thing, he said, Although I have been threatened, slandered, and physically attacked, I will never react in anger. Instead, I will try to challenge people's belief. I see too much division in this country, and we've been here for 400 years. Why is this problem still existing? What we do too much of is, we talk about each other, we talk at each other, or we talk past each other. I've found that talking with each other was more effective. Hence the whole dialogue breaking down of the situation kind of thing, because as you can see, he's still alive. Chapter 5. Accounting of his life as a walking, talking, proper activist. Due to several articles, even Wiki not really accounting his life in years, it will be more of a recollection of interviews and quotes said by him and of the things he has done since then till today. The years may be stated if the information is available, but don't be too dependent on it. Daryl always preferred recounting his conversation of clan members as they converted themselves, that Daryl himself only provided the medium that enabled them to do so. Through three decades, he knew the ins and outs of the org, its ethos and hierarchy, which allowed him to be the first black person who wrote a book titled Clandestine Relationships, A Black Man's Odyssey in the Ku Klux Klan, which was published in 1998. Shout out to Space Odyssey. As per stated in chapter four, through the relationship with Mr. Kelly and the converted members, the consistency of what tied them together was that they had a multitude of misconceptions of black people and the majority of it was accredited to, you guessed it, brainwashing they endured since their youth. This is also an important point as the pillars of how a teen is as an adult, which is always tied back to their nurture and the nature that surrounds them, like who raised them what were they raised by, what were they surrounded with, you know, like the culture that surrounded them. If it's violence, the conservatives always take the route of it's the shooting games that did that, no. That one may be, it's like a tiny fragment in a plethora of things that surrounded them, so. Anywho, as of now, and the information available, Daryl is currently an official advisor to the decentralized social network named Minds. He uses the platform to educate people on how to conduct civil discourse and to find common ground while building tolerances for each other. You know, there's always some things we disagree with people. And on Forbes, he said, You have an open forum where people are invited to bring their diverse ideas, even their beliefs, which people may not find it popular to have civil discourse about it. The art of conversing with one another has been lost. The forum will allow people to come on there and to be able to be transparent. To have a conversation, unlike some other platforms on the internet, it has its pros and cons at the end of the day, so yeah. I apologize for like the abrupt ending, but then again, there wasn't really much to talk about him because most of his stuff is either through Wikipedia, several other informative websites, are being paywalled. Why? And initially, I didn't even want, I didn't even know about him until there was this question from historic vids on Twitter. And they said, who's the most notorious badass in history? And the answer by the giraffe made me go, holy shit, why not do about him? It's cool. You know, like, I have never thought an R&B musician would do this kind of thing, but here we are, you know, and I'm pretty sure nowadays it's more common to have, like, you know, your stands on Twitter and shit, but in 1980, like, 
what you know so these are the screenshots and i really thank them thank the giraffe and historic wits for you know inspiring me to create this video pretty cool even though there's not a lot to work on other than dialogues and stuff but i think we learned a bit a thing or two here today which is which is his methodology to combat any form of extremism that remains relevant you know open the dialogue listen challenge deconstruct and so on and so forth if the opposing isn't moved it isn't your fault it takes time to mend a mind that has already been broken prior to your meeting you know and that includes myself because 90% of the time i would react to a situation and talk about it instead of talking to it I'd be like, what the heck, man? This super racist person or like, you know, in today, modern Malaysia, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to name names, but in Malaysia, we have a group of uh, politicians. Imagine the Japan flag, but the outer is green and the inner is white. I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to put anything on the screen in case my ass is getting flagged or whatever. But this group of people are notorious for being racist and i know it's hard to say but these are the types of people that daryl is talking about yeah they're not kkk they're not specifically hating on people but the news outlets and what they say is so obvious of what they're trying to do and instead of just talking about it to people you know making fun of them which rightfully so that we can do we also must need to approach it from like Daryl Davis's perspective. Like you just have to open a dialogue with them. Like one of the random people that follows the that group, you know, and be like, "What's up, you guys? Wait, why do you want to do this?" And then you let them talk. You let them, you know, gush out. And if you and if you hear something odd, combat it in a more civilized way. And yeah. Because reading through whatever Daryl Davis did, I mean, I also obviously learned as well, am I going to implement it in time? Because you can't just overnight change your perspective and be super nice to like that one asshole. You have to take time. You're a person, you know, it's normal. As Andrew from Channel 5 has said, practice radical listening and radical empathy. I know, I know that guy has flagged and he's now in um, rehab for something he's done, but the point still stands. If you guys don't know who Channel 5 is, it's like this YouTube thingy that I watch through H3. Shout out H3. I love you guys. But it's this guy that goes to interview like the most radical American things like uh, QAnon. He goes to rallies that like are uh, supremacist white people. And what he does is really cool because... He goes in, allows them to talk their minds, what they believe in. And he always ends some of his videos by saying, always practice radical listening and radical empathy because you don't know what the hell they're going through, right? So at the end of the day, just be a Daryl Davis or an Andrew from Channel 5. Be like, hey, what's bugging you, man? And then you allow them to spill the beans and stuff like that. So remember, challenge the thought process instead of talking of it to other people. Go to the people to talk about it deconstructed and hopefully become friends so yeah that's about it um i'll talk about another thing in a, a couple weeks time and i hope this was educational enough so thank you for being here thank you for watching thank you for leaving me in your background if you're having me in your background and see you in a couple weeks time